welcome to this meditation session here at the Buddhist Library. This is the third session that I've taught over the last three weeks. And each session I'm trying to introduce you to a different type of meditation. Remember I said last week the Buddha taught over 40 different types of meditation and all of them are very different in terms of their intention. What What is the purpose of these different types of meditation? Some of them are about contemplating a topic. Some of them are about stilling the mind. And others like one that we're doing today are about developing some insight, some wisdom. So have you noticed that it's quite warm? <laughs> hot day, right? It's going to be a very hot day here in Sydney. And so I thought a good opportunity to think about the four element practice. Have you ever heard of this meditation before? The meditation on the four great elements? This is Chatura um, Datu. And these are, I say elements, perhaps a better word, better translation might be property, because um, it kind of, element sounds very solid and fixed. The properties kind of, is a little bit more movable, right? So, but because I've gotten into the habit of saying element, I just can't stop. So what are the four elements? Earth, water, fire, and air. There is an order, but I don't think it really matters. And so in some suttas, in some of the teachings, in some Buddhist traditions, there's more. Actually, there's things like space or consciousness. Uh, the Chinese tradition also has wood as an element. And these are a very basic way to kind of break down this universe into easily digestible chunks of information, right? So this was an idea that was around at the time of the Buddha, that there are these things that are earth and they have certain qualities about them, like the earth is, for example, hard or soft or smooth or rough. This earth element. Earth element is things like the soil, the rock, trees. It's also the food that we eat. It's also our body, parts of our body. Anything that is solid in our body is the earth element. And then there's the water element. Well, the water element is anything that is liquid, right? So things like rivers, lakes, rain, but also things in our body like uh, saliva or tears, right? And the same with um, the fire element, anything that is, or the heat element, anything that is hot or cold, right? And of course, the wind element is anything that is moving, pushing, or oscillating, just like the wind or our breath. Actually, I was, I was just thinking. Today, I've had some stomach problems recently. I've come back in the last few days. Very painful, um, uh, start shedding, shedding pain in my abdomen. And this was something that was experienced also at the time of the Buddha by the monk. And this was regarded at that time as having like an excess of the wind element in the body. And so this is one way that perhaps you could kind of depersonalize this illness, right? This is like not just happening to me, it's just an excess of this property that exists in the world and in yourself. Or when you're hot, it's because of an excess of the fiery end of that heat element. And when you're cold, it's the other end of that heat element, the cold. And so the purpose of this meditation isn't to make a scientific analysis of the periodic table. It's a simple 
simple way for us to start to understand what is this thing I call myself. We start to investigate what are the things that make up this thing I call myself, this body, this me, this mind, this mind. And so in the Patipatthana Sutta, we see that there's an analysis of the four elements that is grouped under the theories of meditation to do with the body. There's an investigation of our body. And the way the Buddha starts, quite hard for is imagine if there was a cow strung up at the crossroad, the crossroad and slaughtered by a butcher. The butcher would kind of divide it into parts and put that bit over there and that bit over there and that bit over there, right? And this is what we're doing with our mind when we do this contemplation. We're looking at our body and we're seeing, ah, there's the earth element, there's the water element. And we observe it internally. These are the instructions of the Buddha. Observe it internally. Observe it externally in the world around us, in other people. Observe the link between the inside and outside experience of this element. Understand that there's just this element. And in this way, we can begin to question our idea of a fixed, stable, permanent self, of a me, mine, mine. And this is one of the Buddha's core teachings, anatta, non-self, not self, understanding the dependently arisen causes and conditions that make up this being here so many things come together to make us. We stay for a short time, but it's always changing, changing. You didn't start out like this, my friends. No, you were conceived with DNA from your mother and your father. You were grown in your mother's uterus. You were fed with food grown in the soil. You breathed this air. You grew, you changed. You're not fixed or stable. And one way that we kind of understand this is by acknowledging the role, the very fundamental building blocks of this world, earth, water, fire, wind. This is all that we are too. Why then do we cling so strongly at this idea of myself? And so this is the purpose of this Meditation is to develop some insight into the nature of not self. So, it's a guided meditation. We better get started, hey? So, let's take a comfortable position, something that allows you to sit for the next half an hour and to be comfortable as we make this investigation into this body. So you can close your eyes, relax, and just spend a few moments settling in to being here now in this place. This is time for meditation practice. Everything else can wait. Just for this short time, allow yourself to be here, everything else, don't worry about it, let it go, just spend a few moments coming quiet and still.
Now that we've settled in a little, we begin our contemplation of the four elements. We begin with the earth element. So the earth element is anything in this body that is hard, such as your teeth, your bones, your nails. This is the earth element. Has the characteristic of hardness. And also softness. Soft like the skin under your armpit or soft like those little downy hairs around your temple. Anything that is hard or soft, this is the earth element. Scanning your body now, looking for those things that are hard or soft. Understanding, ah, these have the characteristic of hardness, softness. This is the earth element in this body. The earth element is also things that are heavy. Like the weight in your buttock, or the weight in the balls of your feet, the heaviness of your hand in the lap. This is the heaviness characteristic of the earth element. Or the lightness that we see in things like the eyelashes, or the little hairs in your ears. A light touch of the breath. This is also the earth element. Whatever is heavy or light. And whatever is rough, like the soles of your feet, dry skin on your elbows, top of your tongue, this is also the earth element, things that are rough and things that are smooth. Smooth like your gum. Smooth like your internal organ. This is also the earth element. So we see this earth element in this body through these various characteristics, anything that is hard or soft, heavy or light, rough or smooth, to see these things in your body, not as you, not as mine, but as the earth element in its different characteristics.
So we observe the internal in this body. And we observe this earth element externally also. We see the rock, the heaviness, the hardness of rock. We see the roughness of the earth. The smoothness of pebbles. All around us, there's this earth element. And so we contemplate seeing this earth element externally. Other people have this earth element. And the world around us is made up of this earth element too. It doesn't belong to me, it's not mine. And then we contemplate internally and externally how that earth element outside is taken in to this body. There is food that is grown in the soil. We consume this food, which is nothing more than the earth element. We use it for fuel to grow this body. And then it comes back out returning to the earth. There is just the earth element. No me, no mine. And at the end of my life, This body will return to the earth. It is only borrowed from the earth element. It does not belong to me. This is not mine. This is not me. This is not myself. And in the same way, we can contemplate the water element internally in this very body. The water element has the characteristics of anything that is liquid. Anything that flows. So we see this water element in our tears, in our spit, in our snot, in our blood, 
urine. This is the water element. Our sweat. Our body composed so much of water. So this is just the water element in this body. You see it internally. And externally we see other people sweat, other people cry. They have the earthly water element too. Does not belong to me, it's not mine. This is just the water element. And we see it in rivers and lakes, rain, the ocean. And so we contemplate the water element externally. and both internally and externally, all that water that is in our body, it comes from outside of us. We drink it. It comes into our body. It stays for some time. We borrow it. And then it comes back out. As sweat, as urine, as tears. It doesn't belong to us. It is not mine. Without it, we would quickly die. And at the end of our life, when we die, the fluids will leak from our body. Our skin will dry up. The water evaporating, dissipating. We we'll return to nature. Why then do I regard this body as me, as mine, as myself. And next, we'll examine the heat element in this body. This is anything that is hot or cold. There are parts of our body that are warmer. Our armpit, our groin, and parts that are colder, our ears, our nose, our toes.
inside our body, outside our body. This is the heat element in this body. There is also the fire that transforms the food we take in into fuel. And this is also this heat element that transforms, matures. Fuel for this body. And so we see this heat element internally. Anything that is hot or cold or in between. And that digestive process, transforming food into fuel. And externally, we see this heat element. We see other people sweat, they shiver, they're cold. We see extremes of heat in nature, volcanoes, fires, extremes of coldness, snow and ice. This is the external heat element, anything that is hot or cold. All the heat we experience here on Earth comes from the power of the sun, creating day and night. The season, coldness, heat, hot in the sunlight, cold in the shadow. This is not my heat. This is the heat element that is external that comes into this body through sunlight, through things like the cold. All of this heat element we experience is from the external heat source. And when at the end of our life, we die, all that heat from our body will leave. Our body will become colder and colder until that human heat is gone. Why then? Why do I cling so strongly at this body? I do not own the heat of my body. It does not belong to me. It's not mine. It's not me. It's not myself. And lastly, 
we investigate the wind element. This is anything that is pushing, moving, oscillating in this body. Like the way the breath pushes in and out. Or even the way the blood pulses through the body. It's all our burps and farts. It's that expansion of our lung, holding that space inside of the lung, the esophagus, the nostrils, the mouth. That space is supported by this wind element. And so we see the wind element internally. And external. Other people breathe, they burp. And all around us, the atmosphere, we see the wind moving through the tree, hurricane a light breeze. This is the wind element, external to us, which we take in with every breath. We borrow this external wind element for a short time only. There's a gaseous exchange in the lung, and we breathe it back out. It does not belong to us. It is not mine. We are dependent on this external wind element. Without it, we would quickly die. And at the end of our life, we'll take one last breath in. One last breath out. And we'll never breathe in again. That last breath is the end of life. That breath will be beyond your control. It does not belong to you. It is not yours. It is borrowed only briefly. Why then? Do I cling so strongly to this ownership of this body, of me, my, mine? This is not me, not mine, this is not myself.
So this is the investigation, this contemplation of the four great elements of earth, water, heat, and wind. Let's take a few moments to review, still with your eyes closed, how was that for you? How was it to divide this body, this self, into these parts and the not self? Was there something that stood out for you, an element that was more important than the other, or a part of the body that resonated more with you? Ask yourself why. And lastly, remember those different analyses of examining internally, externally, both internally and externally, by seeing that there is just this element, that it is borrowed, that it does not belong to you. And in this way, when we practice this regularly, we chip away at this view of a fixed permanent self, fixed permanent identity. And we understand the Buddha's teaching of not-self, anatta. So now you can relax your awareness, coming back to this space. And arise from the meditation. Very good. It was nice to see our friends online. Welcome, Harry. Hi, Michael. Hello, Gillian. Hello, Death. Anoma Yapa. Hi. So... Nice to have people joining in wherever they are to do this very important practice. So, have any of you done that one before? Just one? Was it with me or with someone else? I have cat. Yeah. Who taught it for you? Sujato. Yeah. So it's, it's not a very commonly taught practice, actually, uh, but it's very useful, actually. It's very instructive, right? Did you get an insight into the nature of this body? Did it help loosen that sense of self? Can you see how it would be beneficial in so many ways, not just, you know, surviving a hot day, it's not personal, you know, just the heat, right? What to do? Can't complain. And, and also just very effective also in helping you to um, grasp less strongly at this personality view. And so the Buddha said when he taught this, that it helps us, this practice helps us withstand criticism and abuse that comes our way, verbal abuse. Because we see through this illusion of self when we do this practice. So, Harry, you had a question or a comment? Uh, no, Bhante, thank you very much. I've done that before previously. I found it quite profound, and it helps with that stuff about not-self and not having a fixed sense of yourself and not getting caught up so much in me, mine, whatever, it's all happening to me. I yeah. find it quite profound. It, it's a way into understanding not-self. It's quite hard otherwise, I think. That's right. Sometimes what-self can... What-self? What's that? Not self. Not self can be a very difficult to grasp topic, right? Very intellectualized sometimes. 
But this is a very practical way of coming to understand it. But this body of yours is not yours, you know? You can't change a damn thing. Those grey hairs, the sagging skin, the creaking bones, and it didn't belong to you beforehand. But you're made up of other people's DNA, the food, the elements, education, everything. So many things come into making this thing which appears to be solid and stable, you, but actually when you break it down, you don't actually exist in the way that you think you might. Right? This is a very, very useful meditation technique. So some, some meditation techniques are about quieting the mind, stilling the mind, overcoming discursive thought. Other meditation techniques, we actually work with the thinking mind. These are maybe sometimes we call them contemplations or reflections or investigations. And these can help us as well as um, give us some insight and some wisdom. And so don't be afraid to think. Quite useful to think. Uh, but also don't neglect your other practices of calming the mind and stilling the mind, such as anapanasati or clear awareness, being uh, like a uh, balanced awareness kind of thing. Does anyone have any questions before we finish up? Yes. Yeah, great question. So the question was, how does this relate to the psychological aspect of self? where we need to have things like a good sense of self-esteem. And the way that the Buddha taught, he didn't teach that there wasn't such a thing as self. He didn't say that there was no self, like there's no self, like you don't exist, you're an illusion. He didn't quite say that. It's more you don't exist in the way that you think you do. And he was particularly talking about a concept of self that opposed some of the dominant views of self that were around at the time of the Buddha which was that self can be permanent, that you join with Brahma, for example, that you, um, that you are eternal. And the Buddha disagreed with this, and so he was kind of trying to show how it was different to those commonly held beliefs at the time. And the Buddha encouraged us to identify not so much with the doer, but the doing of good action, for example. So, excuse me. So the meditation we did last week, Chaga Nusati, like we're identifying with our good actions. And it helps to see ourselves as a good person. But actually, that person is just made up of good actions. What makes a good person is good actions, right? What makes a bad person is just their actions. If they change their actions, they'll be a good person too. And so we don't identify too strongly with the idea of the person, but more the qualities that makes them exist as this kind of blob of atom, as this blob of uh, quality in this particular moment. And that's why uh, I gave a talk last night, was it last night? Tuesday night, where I mentioned the mass murderer Anguli Mala, who had killed 999 people, but went on to become an enlightened being and help many people. So he changed his actions, right? We don't fix him in a particular way. So this investigation of not self is very useful also for when we think about other people. We don't fix them. They're like this, they're like that. We don't allow them to change. If we see these things changing in ourselves, if we see there's just these things arising and passing away, breath coming in, breath going out, water coming in, piss coming out, you know, other people, they're also changing too. And so we can give them the benefit of the doubt sometimes, you know, rather than saying, oh, they're a bad person or fixing them at a certain point or time, which give them a lot more room to, to become something different in our mind. 
So identify with the good qualities that we have, try to cultivate good qualities of body, speech, and mind. And this, this is what makes a good, e a good self-esteem, good ego, you know. It's important, you're right, to feel good about yourself and to feel good about, um, you know, who we are. We want to feel safe, we want to feel supported, we want to feel that we can be ourselves. And so you don't have to just get rid of, like, your entire personality. And as I also talked about with the week, Buddha really praised people's individual qualities and say there's nothing there, like you're really good at this thing, you're really good at that thing. And so, you know, we can identify with these qualities. Like this is, this is, um, a, uh, Ajahn Tanisaro called this a strategy. And it's a bit more than a strategy, but it's just a way into understanding. Um, the higher stages of the path, like stream entry, uh, one of the things that is destroyed is that view of personality, that view of self, the Sakaya Ditti. And this is that self view or personality view. And so this practice leads towards that goal. That's the point of this practice, is because to reach the very upper limits of the path, we need to let go of this view of me. And we're going to have to let go of this body <laughs> anyway. We've let go of countless bodies before. So it's kind of like a shortcut to kind of get people to see the truth of, you know, the impermanence of our existence, the changing nature of our body. And you know the desire to overcome our attachment to bodies, our attachment to me, our attachment to this idea of self. And when we overcome that, we're on our way to full enlightenment. There won't be any more rebirth. You won't take another body. You've seen through this illusion. And remember, the reason that we're stuck with bodies that sweat and that and that are messy and that get old and ache is because of our attachment to self. Our attachment to this idea of me, mine. And our attachment is what we're trying to shake up through this kind of investigation. It doesn't belong to you. It's all because of the sun. You know? And it doesn't belong to you. It's, this water has to come from somewhere outside of you. You can't keep it forever. And so this is what we're what we're trying to overcome, this attachment to our view of self. It's 10 past one. So if you have a life, um, please run. If you don't have a life, stay and do some more meditation. Yes, of course. Yes, yes, it's a good question. How do you let go when you have a pain from inside? This is what I talked about before you arrived, actually. Like, at the moment, my body is very painful. I have a lot of pain in my body. And when I break it down to something like, oh, this is just the wind element, moving through the body, then it's not my body, it's just the wind element. And it just allows my mind to let go a little bit of that idea of this is my pain, my experience, and this is about me. It's like, oh, it's just the wind element moving around, doing its thing. And so this helps us. And the same, you know, I'm sitting here sweating, I start to get really uncomfortable and make a big fuss. I'm sweating, it's me. It's just that this heat is here. It's not like personal to me. And so in these ways, we kind of allow the mind some um, letting go of the attachment and it's, it's attachment to ourselves. Sometimes there is such a thing as pain. You know, the body experiences pain. Yeah. And yeah, this is 
the nature of having a body. Accepting that it's there and allowing the mind some space in between the pain and the experience of it so that we don't hurt ourselves twice. Sometimes when you stub your toe, you can make such a fuss about it, you amplify that pain. And then sometimes if you stub your toe and you don't make a big deal out of it, it doesn't hurt as much at all. So our reaction to pain is don't shoot yourself twice. Yeah. If there's some pain, be aware of your response to that pain. This is the Buddha called this the second arrow, the second dart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, it's the way it is. And you can't control people, they can't control themselves. We can barely control our own mind. So, yeah, we see this is also the nature of not self, right? Conditioned being, causes and results. And this is why when we come to the Buddhist path, we have this really precious opportunity to work on our mind and to just improve ourselves. We just try, we, all we can do is improve our own mind and hopefully we'll have some benefit. We'll show others we can act with kindness and with love and this hopefully will inspire people to change their minds too. This is the beauty of the Buddhist path, yeah, this opportunity to to train our mind and to grow.